church to another to try and get their pull the service started. I don't think I've told you before, but I struggle like this because uh, since I was 18 years old, I had had a disease, a spinal disease called ankylosing spondylitis, and it has fused my hips and various places along my spine, and it uh, causes a lot of inflammation in my up and down my spine, and it's. Uh, Needless to say, uncomfortable. Been uncomfortable all these years, but the Lord has continued to bless me. So uh, you pray for me, and if you see me stumble or something, you understand why. Did uh, did you, you, everyone get one of these handouts for uh, his quotations that we're going to look at in, shortly from uh, Ellen White's writings? Everyone have one? Okay. We'll get to those in, in just a few moments. I changed the uh, I changed the title of the sermon at the last minute. I'm good at that. <laughs> uh, I inserted one one extra word there. Uh, I originally told him Jesus, our substitute, would be the title, but it's Jesus our actual substitute. Hopefully that will be more meaningful to you as we go along. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we turn to your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit to once again keep your promise to us by leading us and guiding us into your truth. This is not truth because we think it is or want it to be or have some special interpretation it is truth because it comes directly from your word and as we focus on it we hope that you will once again teach us lead us and guide us we ask in jesus name amen, amen. definition of substitution Simply replacing one or replacing one person or a thing with another. In the judgment of God, sin, that is lawlessness, is paid for with the life of the sinner or an appropriate and acceptable substitute. Amen? few examples. Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 through 5. Cain brought his offering to God. They were some of his crops that he had raised. But it was not acceptable to God. So it therefore was not a, an, accept, an acceptable substitution. His brother Abel on the other hand brought his offering to God. And it was acceptable to the Lord. It was his, the firstborn of his flock. Moving on then to Genesis 22 and the stories about Abraham. At his most trying moment, Abraham takes his son up to Mount Moriah. And there he's been told by God to give his son as an offering to him. And he wants to be faithful to God, of course, but he sure is puzzled. Hebrews later tells us that he reckons in his thinking that undoubtedly after he sacrifices his son that uh, God is going to raise him from the dead. That's the only thing that he can have hope in. So as he raises the knife to kill his son and make his offering, God knows that in his heart he's made that decision and he, he sends a ram. He causes a ram to appear hung up in the bushes. This 
becomes an acceptable sacrifice to God instead of Abraham's son, Isaac. Another one, Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 12. You can read, the, read this later today. It summarizes what God gave to his people through Moses back at Mount Sinai. It was the temporary object lesson of the ceremonial system. And there in Hebrews explain, explains the different roles that Jesus has in that. And what, what happened before Jesus came, how each one of those ministries were, were met with acceptable substitutes. And then Hebrews 7 verses 27, uh, 26 through uh, 27 tells of God the Son offering himself. How many times? Oh, you're not listening, are you? God himself offers himself once for all. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the permanent acceptable sacrifice. So all of these other biblical examples dealt with acceptable or unacceptable sacrifices, God was very specific to his people in every situation what he wanted them to bring to him. Finally, it all led to the coming of Jesus and him dying on the cross at Calvary. The first major point I want to bring to you is how could God legally qualify to be man's substitution? Just like Adam was, we were in Adam, in other words, he was our representative of the human race. So how did Jesus, how was he able to become that representative of the human race? This is a very important biblical point, so I want you to... Uh, Follow me closely, if you can. For God to legally become man's substitute, he would have to do two things. First of all, he would have to meet all the positive demands in that sacrifice of his own law. Okay? Secondly, he would have to fulfill all of the justice of the law. Those two things were required in his sacrifice. According to scripture, he did this in the person of his son, Jesus. He obtained the legal justification, not just for those who believe, but for all mankind. Amen. Because remember, this was done be while we were yet sinners in the eyes of God. That decision had already been made before this earth ever came into existence. Okay? I want you to turn with me now to Romans 5. We're going to look at a few, a few verses here that indicate this. Romans 5, verse 18. Therefore, as one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so. Through one man's, notice that's a capital M in my Bible, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to how many? All men, resulting in justification of life. All men were justified in this decision. All right, turn over to chapter 10, verse 4. Romans 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Titus 2.10. Titus. Chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's back up to verse 9. 
exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all. We might say has appeared for all. First John two two. First John chapter two and verse two. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for what? The whole world. Amen. The sin, the sins of all mankind were paid for in the death of Christ. Whether they wind up accepting him or not. By his perfect life, Jesus met the demands of the law. Requirement one. By his death, Jesus met the justice of the law. Requirement two. By his resurrection, this is a step further than those two requirements that were needed. By his resurrection, Jesus raised and re the redeemed human race, which was our body that he took on, glorified and cleansed of all sin and its consequences. Can you say amen to that? Amen. By our faith, it is all ours. I'm so glad of that. Amen. But it does not become effective for us as individuals unless we accept it individually in faith. So there is a part, there is a part for us to do. And you may not recall this, but even the faith is not ours because he gives us that measure of faith from the beginning of our life. So while he does everything, yes, he gives us the opportunity to make that decision one way or another, to actually think it out in our mind and then make a decision to accept him or not. <clears throat> we must fully identify ourselves with every aspect of his life, death, and resurrection can't just take one or two of those three things. We've got to accept it all. We have to identify ourselves with it all. Second main point. The Apostle Paul explains that all mankind was made legally right with God through the in Christ motif or the concept of solidarity. This is a strange concept to us of Western thinking, but it is not strange to those in the Far East. Motif means a usual reoccurring theme. A usual reoccurring theme. Paul's explanation in most of his letters is recognized in the usual reoccurring thematic phrases of in Christ, by Christ, in him, by him, through him, with him, in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus, or in the beloved. And I'm sure there's probably others. But this is the theme that he uses to express the gospel all through his letters about us being in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse, and uh, Ephesians 1 and 2. Let's turn there, please. This is probably his most complete list 
of blessings that we have received, spiritual blessing, blessings from the Father. Not going to read them all. Starting at verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places where? In Christ. In Christ. If we're not in Christ, none of those blessings belong to us. Now, I want you to notice that throughout these chapters 1 and 2, as he articulates each one of these blessings, he tells us, he points out, that it's all because we are, each one is all because we are in Christ. Verse 4, he says that, God chose us to be holy and without blame in Christ. Five and six. He says God predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters in Christ. Verse seven. He says we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How? In Christ. Come on down to uh, verses 15 through 20. I'm skipping a few here. The past prayers of the apostles. Maybe you've never thought about this, but just like when Jesus prayed to the Father for us at the last during the Last Supper, he was looking down the corridors of time in his mind and asking the Father that we become one with the Father like he became one. So the prayers of the apostles as they continued in their ministry after Jesus, some of those prayers were aimed at us generations down the road so that we would become blessed in Christ. He's, they said, he said that we would receive wisdom, revelation, knowledge, and understanding about the riches of our inheritance. We have a, ri a rich inheritance, don't we? Amen. Yes, we do. Plus, he says, we're going to learn more about the power of God in his resurrection. But that's all going to take place, become real in Christ. Come down to uh, all right, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. God's great love for us was shown by when we were dead in our sins, we were made alive in Christ. No other way. Uh, verses 8 through 10. We have been saved by God's grace through our faith in Jesus. Not because we did anything to earn it. It is the gift of God to all mankind. Amen. Not just those who accept it, but all mankind. It, it's a gift to all. We are his workmanship in Christ. We were once created in Adam, but were lost. Not because of anything we've done or said or thought. We were lost before that. We were lost before we ever came into this world because of our father, Adam. Our only inheritance we could receive from Adam was being lost. Verse 10, he continues on, this uh, chapter 2, verse 10, and when the time was right, for the Father to send Jesus to save sinners, God cre created humanity again in Christ. God created humanity again in Christ. Amen. For works of righteousness that we should walk in them. 
This is Paul's in Christ reoccurring theme about all mankind. But how did God create humanity a second time, you may ask? Again, it was through the in Christ theme and the substitution that was mentioned in our scripture reading, the teaching of the two Adams. Starting with the incarnation of the word of God, Romans 8, 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God took our sinful flesh and made a human body for Jesus. Hebrews 10, 5 verifies this. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, came into the world, he said to the Father, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So God joined that body of his son in the womb of Mary. Hebrews 2, 17 says, Because in all things he had to be made like his brethren. That's why he put Jesus, the Son of God, into the womb of Mary, because he had to be made like we were made, that is, his humanity. This was so he could redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. Jesus assumed that sinful body, but it did not make him a sinner as some people indicate or believe that it did. Jesus assumed that sinful body, but it did not make him a sinner like it did when we inherited the sinful nature from Adam. This is because the only nature that you or I could inherit from Adam was his sinful nature. Yet this was not the case for Jesus. Before, during, and after his incarnation, he was always, he has always been the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Never been a change in who he really was. His identity has always been divine, sinless, the essence of selfless love. Even after becoming the man with our nature, while being able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. It is not true that while assuming the nature of sinful man, it caused Jesus to be a sinner. It's just not so. We'll see how that, how that is so. Clothing himself in our humanity did not change who Jesus really is. Now let me give you a simplistic illustration. We go to bed at night. And I'm not going to get into what you wear or don't wear for sleep time, but the point is we are who we are when we go to bed, right? We're the same person when we wake up, right? And then according to various aspects of the day that we're facing, uh, whether uh, where we're going or what we're going to do, we choose clothing to put on for that day, right? We put that clothing on, and when we put that clothing on, we look different than we did when we went to bed, right? Sure, but it hasn't changed who we are, right? Come on, are you with me? It hasn't changed who we are. We may look different, we may appear different, but it hasn't changed who we are. If we wear winter clothing, 
they may help us stay warm, right? If we wear summer clothing, they may help us to stay cooler, right? Whatever we clothe ourselves in will have an effect on our personal experience for that day, but will it change who we are? No. We appear different, but it doesn't change who we are. This is how it was for Jesus. Being clothed in our humanity did not change who Jesus really is. He stayed the same. He'll always stay the same. Notice the wording that Ellen White uses. Now you can pull out your handout. These are just a few of the quotations that I went through and, and, and typed up for you. Uh, but I hope you see, notice the wording that she uses in some of these quotes because it's, it's very revealing. The first one up there says the humanity of the Son of God is what? How much to us? Everything. Everything. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man, 100% man, but 100% God. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. Amen. First selected messages, page 244. Come down to the fourth one. He clothed himself in our filthy garments. You like that wording? goes right along with what the Bible is teaching us. He clothed himself in our filthy, filthy garments that we might wear the spotless robe of his righteousness, which was woven in the loom of heaven. <laughs> Signs of the Times, May 23, 1895. Another one from Signs of the Times. He left the glories of heaven and clothe his divinity with humanity and subjected himself to sorrow and shame and reproach, abuse, denial, and crucifixion. Though he had all the strength of the passions of humanity, never did he yield to temptation to do that which was not pure and elevating and ennobling. Amen. The last one, clad, that's an old word that we don't use much anymore, clad in the vestments, what are vestments? Clothing, right? Clad in the vestments of humanity, the Son of God came down to the level of those he, came, he wished to to save. In him was no guile or sinlessness. In Jesus there was none. He was ever pure and undefiled. Yet he took upon him our sinful nature. Clothing his divinity with our humanity. That he might associate with fallen humanity he sought to redeem for man that which, by disobedience, Adam had lost. Review and Herald, August 22, 1907. Clothing himself in our sinful humanity never changed who Jesus really is because none of the sins were his. He bore no responsibility for any of the sins that he took upon himself. And since none of the sins were his, the father could then legally raise him up from the grave yeah, with yeah. us in him. Could we have been raised up if we weren't in him? 
No. We had to be in him. And he continues to be clothed in our humanity, that glorified, recreated humanity. Third and final point, major point, our how did Jesus in our humanity save mankind from sin? In Christianity, there are two answers given to this question, but only one is a New Testament teaching of Paul. That one teaching is the basis for the correct doctrine of substitution. How did Jesus in our humanity save mankind from sin? The first answer is vicariously. Now this is a word that most of us are familiar with. Vicarious means in the place of. In the place of. What is vicarious substitution then? It is substituting Jesus' sinless human nature in the place of our sinful nature. Let me say that again. It is substituting Jesus' sinless nature in the place of our sinful nature. His perfect obedience and sacrificial death were substituted in the place of the human race. I'm telling you this because this is what this is what vicarious substitution teaches. Evangelical Christianity and a good portion of Seventh-day Adventists have accepted this form of substitution. How did Jesus in our humanity save mankind from sin? The second answer is actually. Actually. So what is actual substitution? In the Bible, actual substitution is explained by Paul. We've been through it. He uses the concept of solidarity, that is, all in one, which is the in Christ or the two Adam teaching. The vicarious view of substitution reveals that Christ did not fully identify with or become one with the humanity he came to save. Is that important? Yes, it's important. If he expects us to identify with him fully, then why would he not be expected to identify with us fully? Down through history, this has caused theological problems. In the minds of many, including all Muslims, by the way, this has raised a valid ethical question as to whether this method of salvation is legal. The main cause of this question is that no law, God's or man's, allows an innocent man to die instead of the guilty. This is why we have a criminal court system, right? Because we don't want somebody who's not guilty to be convicted for something they didn't do. Romans 3, verses 10 and 23. There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Finally, Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, very similar. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. 
a person shall be put to death for his own sin. But didn't Jesus die for the sins of all mankind? Wasn't he actually sinless? Yes. But to actually qualify as the second Adam that was mentioned in our scripture reading, he had to actually be both sinless and one with us. He had to be without sin, yet made sin for us. Ever thought about that? But how is this actually possible? The answer is found again in the in Christ and to Adam's teaching. When God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, placed the Son of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary, he did so by forming a body of fallen corporate humanity for Jesus to live in, like you and I. The fallen humanity was all of us, allowing Jesus to fully identify with us, that is to become one with us, but without his sinning. You heard me say that, right? But without him sinning. The Father clothed Jesus with our sinful humanity, and because we were in Him, we lived the perfect life that He lived in Him. We died the death He died in Him. We were buried and resurrected in Him. Jesus is our new corporate history. No longer under Adam's history because Jesus became the second Adam. Amen? Amen. But for that history to become effective in us, if it is to have the desired effect in us that God wanted it, wanted it to do, we must totally surrender to what God did with us in Christ. The objective or factual truth of the matter applies to all mankind, but only those who believe this truth and actually accept it will be saved. Now, in closing, Does the actual form of substitution protect us against cheap grace? You know what cheap grace is, don't you? We Adventists especially are scared of cheap grace showing up. Actual substitution in the context of justification by faith prevents what true Christians are afraid of, namely being against God's law, which produces cheap grace. We understand that many of our friends and relatives uh, get caught up in this mode of cheap grace. They love Jesus. They do some things in order to show that they follow Jesus. They go to church sometimes more than we do. They praise him. They pray to him. They do all the things that they're supposed to do. But a lot of times when we see them living their lives, as some of us are just as guilty doing, they don't follow up with what they say they believe. Cheap grace. 
they think as long as I continue to believe in Jesus, it really doesn't make a big difference how I live my life. Now, many of them won't tell you that, but all you have to do is look at the evidence of their life. That is what Ellen White calls being buried alive. Christianity is more than simply believing the truth. A true Christian actually participates in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. This is the true truth, righteous, true righteousness by faith doctrine that God brought to his people in 1888 through A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, and it was confirmed by Ellen G. White. If it is actually received, it will change the lives of those who receive it. That's guaranteed. Amen. But you have to really believe it. Remember Jesus telling his disciples that have to eat my flesh and drink my blood we have to be consumed with Jesus for it to make a difference in our lives this is because they do not simply accept Jesus in the place of our sinful selves but because we actually participate with our Savior in the total salvation process this is the truth of righteousness by faith. This is what God wanted his people to accept back in 1888. And ever since then, many in the church have been fighting it, turning away from it, not believing in it, not accepting it. And more and more of us are turning to the evangelical form of Christianity and the doctrine of an unacceptable substitute. Jesus is our acceptable substitute. And we must identify with him fully if it's going to make a difference in our lives. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 184, Jesus Paid It All. He did pay it all, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
loving Lord, I want to tell you this morning for myself that you are my actual substitute. And I know that from what the Bible teaches, that is true. I know that it's supposed to make a difference in my life. And sometimes I look at my life and I I wonder if if somehow or another I've just given up on you. Perhaps my brothers and sisters have had days where they feel like that. But then something reminds me, something happens, a word, a thought is mentioned in my thinking. Uh, I hear something on the radio, uh, read something in my Bible, and it helps me re-spark that love that identity with you that I so desperately need. I'm asking you, Lord, not just for myself, but for all of your people. Please help us to better understand the truth of your word, that it might have a desired effect on each of us, and we can be ready to go home with you when Jesus comes. This is our prayer. We pray it in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.